Well, hello YouTube, it's me Fortmaster, and welcome back to another Laser Pig reaction. You know, I have to say this again, but for some reason, when I first subscribed to, uh, to this guy, I was under the impression that he was going to be like John Tron, where he just, he'd like, he'd be radio silent for like half a year and then put out one really good video. But no, he puts out really good videos all the time. So, so, today's video. John Boyd, Maverick, Hero, or Fraud? Now, I'm having a little twit tingling at the side of my brain because I can't remember who John Boyd is or if I've heard that name before. Uno Momento. So, this looks like it's going to be fun. Let's let's start, shall we? <laughs> the delightful laser pig. SCP-96? Wait a minute. Which one was SCP-96 again? Oh, right, yeah, the screen... <sighs> Forgetting what his nickname was now, but he was the one that like will chase you and kill you if you see his face. Right. Okay. Just mean. Kids. They're a nightmare, and we all can't be members of the supreme race that can't have them. So what do you do when they're tearing up the walls and screaming when you're trying to do important adult things like take a shit or eat an entire rotisserie chicken? That's why I keep mine busy with New World of Warship, the latest in free-to-play naval PvP RPG SCP wargame available for free on PC. <laughs> world of Warships is an SCP. An amazing graphic set in a world where hundreds of warships of various makes, classes, and accurate to questionable historical legitimacy beat the ever-loving crap out of each other and just look at those water effects mm. water moist nothing shuts these little goblins up faster than vehicular manslaughter with titanic sized warships cruisers submarines aircraft carriers patrick bateman in a canoe I guess. Yeah. All of the essential oils, minerals, mini minerals, and sheer raw lust for the power of naval supremacy that your body needs to grow healthy and strong. No mm. one can resist the power of World of Warships. I'm lowering the containment field now. <laughs> oh, that's what they meant. Okay. But Professor Pig, I don't think it's working. Oh, for the love of. Listen, you little shit, play the goddamn game. We're paying a fortune for this Patrick Bateman cameo. He flew out all this way. Goddamn, he's so <laughs> sexy. Oh, and don't forget to use code LaserPig for a bunch of free stuff, including 500 doubloons, 2 million credits, 10 pages of a premium account, and your choice of free ship from this list, the names of which I cannot pronounce correctly, and the devs are doing it deliberately. They just want to hear me try to see Izukazi again. Play World of Warships. It's free and also now on console. So what's your excuses? I mean, what do you think? <laughs> so click the link in the description <laughs> and download World of Whoop Ships now. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what your excuse is, Susan, because I know you ain't working on that novel you started over a year ago. We're all judging you for it. Anyway. And we're all judging you for it. I want to tell you a little story about a man I once knew called Chungus. I used to play around a lot in the virtual world called Second Life. Yes, 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 yes. I know, hit the cringe alert. Like it was a different time and my mental health was so far down the toilet it had a holiday home on that trash island out in the middle of the Atlantic. I met Chungus during my dabbles with the now deceased World War II combat community. From the first day I spoke to him, it was very obvious that Chungus was a person who led a very, very easy life. They clearly had no real life responsibility and absolutely no lack of free time being that they were perpetually online. They also seemed to have a pretty sizable income and could easily purchase whatever in-game items they wanted for real money, including huge amounts of land, which if you've ever dabbled in Second Life should know is quite expensive. Ah. 
For the normal sewer dwellers of Second Life, their day is spent waltzing around dressed like what a 14 year old thinks an alpha male looks like, with a girl in each arm that has an ass the size of a literal Vauxhall Viva. <coughs> Jungus, however, was not like that. He was a person obsessed with power, or rather the image of power. They were always present in formal military dress uniforms with an increasing number of medals pinned oh, to the no. chest, and he would award himself graciously furnished offices in equally prestigious buildings such as French manor homes or even castles, and his favourite thing to do was to create military roleplay groups and put himself in charge of them. making. No, okay, so not about the military roleplay group, but the whole thing about, like, Second Life, something just occurred to me that with a lot of these things were, like, NFTs we're seeing nowadays, and, like, you know, those, uh, what was it, Earth 2 or whatever, you know, buy a piece of digital land with real money and then have the possibility of selling it later, um, didn't, th at one point, didn't they say the same thing was going to happen with Second Life? Like, literally, there was... I think I remember seeing years ago now, there was an old interview with a couple who actually made it their job where they were Second Life Realtors or something? Oh god, I can't remember now. But like, I'm just, it's the whole, it's that whole saying, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. Oh god. I'm sure he was properly titled at the maximum rank possible. This even included referring to his own house in Second Life as a principality, to which he awarded himself the title of Baroness. Oh, I forgot to mention he was pretending to be a girl in all this. He also oh. liked to roleplay as a Nazi, and had his own group styled after the first SS, with strict dress codes for all the avatars that joined his group, including the blonde hair, blue eyes trope, no furries, and you guessed it, white skin only. No furries, really. Okay, seriously. From just like the service level bits that I've seen, why are there so many Nazi furries? Like seriously, do, do they honestly think they, they they would fit in? As the leader of this group, he awarded himself the title of Führer and built a statue of himself, naked of course. I've taken the liberty of censoring it because, just trust me on this, okay? Now all of that is pathetic enough, but for old yeah. Trungus here, that was never going to be enough. There was always another step, always another title he wanted. And for him, he was obsessed, utterly obsessed, with the title of best fighter pilot in Second Life. Now, there was no governing body that could actually verify who was the best fighter pilot in Second Life, but a lot of various I... fighter plane groups did run events from time to time, and Chungus joined them all and lost every single time. And when he did, he would go off on these wild temper tantrums, rip the cords out of his computer and claimed it had crashed or frozen, or that his opponents were cheating. But no one really gave a shit. No one was really buying his pathetic performances, and the people who had previously looked up to him were starting to change their mind. Okay, um... Sorry to pause again, but I have to wonder, what does any of this have to do with John Boyd? People were whispering behind his back, laughing even. Things were not looking good for old Chungus, especially now since he'd made sure all his friends and cronies in his SS group started to refer to him as the best fighter pilot in Second Life. Instead, he was developing something of the opposite reputation. In open combat regions, that was public regions where there was always a fight and anyone could join in, he was quickly becoming known for the guy who would stay grounded unless his team utterly outnumbered the other. And then he would take off in his custom-made ME262 and claim victory, regardless if or not he'd actually done any fighting. And if the odds changed against him, well then he would just land immediately and man the anti-air guns. He became known as the fastest fighter pilot in Second Life because you only ever saw him running away. Unhappy with this, Chungus hmm. started to avoid open combat regions, and instead began to frequent his own, where he would run contests that were highly rigged to make sure he would win, and at one point even shutting down an aerobatics contest midway through to stop another participant getting a higher score than him. He would then award himself with large fancy trophies, prizes and certificates, and display them all in his own personal hangar at his principality. Of course- And this is all still in Second work. Life! People would laugh at Chungus behind his back, and even people in his own group started to forgo attending events, knowing that Chungus would always win. He became the subject of ridicule, the butt of everyone's jokes, and he did not like that one bit. 
So instead, he decided to reinvent himself. Rather than make a fool of himself in public combat regions or obviously rigged contests, he would just instead not fight at all. Instead, Chungus became an instructor and began advertising his services as a trainer pilot to various fighter plane groups. And since training new pilots on the horrors of trying to fly in 90s technology second life was a job no one wanted, he was pretty successful at this. Here he came into his element. No longer required to actually fight anyone with skill, Chungus stayed in his gracious office writing paper after paper on techniques, formations, theories on combat, all of which sounded good in principle. The best part was, he never had to put any of these into practice, since the only times he would fly was when he was teaching newbie pilots who either didn't know how to dogfight or would fly by the book, meaning when he was mock fighting against them in practice battles, he would always know exactly what they were about to do, exactly how they would react to certain situations because they would do exactly what he taught them. So even when he'd start off in a disadvantaged position, he would always win the practice battles. Meaning a generation of new pilots getting into the community for the first time genuinely started to believe he was the best fighter pilot in Second Life. Now, as you've probably guessed, Chungus is not this person's actual name. I've taken the liberty of disguising this person's identity just because I don't want them being attacked on my behalf. But also you need to understand that all of these events took place more than a decade ago, and this person is still just as active on Second Life, still playing this role, paying huge amounts of money to keep up the visage because they have no life. This is it for them. This is all they have. And their greatest fear is that one day it all just stops working. Or that Second Life just shuts down and they just slowly fade into obscurity. Which is going to happen. Second Life is not going to outlive Chungus, and I'm honestly surprised it's still around today. I mean, the only yeah, reason it has an active population is because it's now inhabited by thousands of lonely boomers pretending to be teenagers. So why tell this story? Why regale you with the story of Chungus? Something that is not particularly unique to the cringe circus of Second Life. Why bring attention to someone so undeserving of it. This is John Boyd largely considered the leader of the fighter plane mafia. He was a veteran of the Korean War, a flight instructor at one of the most prestigious US Air Force flying schools, a respected officer, was buried with full military honours, and is widely considered not only a highly influential man, but to some a national hero. He was also the inventor of the Oda Loop, something the Air Force is still obsessed with. And over the next year, I will be producing content that calls into question the validity of some of his claims and certain aspects of his career. Now, it's not my intention to rob this man of his legacy, certainly not through any action of spite, or because of his association with Pierce Bray, someone I've spoken about previously. I genuinely believe what I will be saying is correct, and as a historian, I feel I have sufficient evidence to back up what it is I'm claiming. See, pretty much everything the public knows about Boyd comes largely not from historical record, but from his own claims and the claims of his friends and colleagues. This oh. one book written about him has been the foundation of a large number of myths, not only about Boyd himself, but about the fighter plane mafia in general. It's from this book that we get the story of Spray's involvement in the A-10 program, as well as Boyd's personal claims that he was the main influence behind the core design of the F-15, and that he and the fighter plane mafia campaigned for a simple or fighter that would eventually become the F-16, that the Air Force would ruin it by forcing it into a ground attack role, and it's here we found the foundations of the main critics behind multi-role aircraft and why so many people even today think it's a stupid idea. And almost everything in this book is completely made up. It was written after Boyd's death and its publication was largely a PR stunt by the fighter plane mafia to promote their own image. The image of them being the backroom whiz kids, the rogues, the radical team quietly trying to tackle the bureaucratic monster and corruption that was the Pentagon's military procurement program. Whereas in reality, they were the corruption they claimed to be fighting. They were the people with the token desk jobs being paid exorbitant salaries at the taxpayers' expense because they had friends in high places who could keep them there. They were the people wasting time and millions, possibly billions, in taxpayers' money trying to fund the development of an aircraft to benefit their own careers at the expense of what would be actually required in the field. And the only real question is if or not they were fully aware of that and were doing it with purpose, or if they had truly deluded themselves into believing that World War I style dogfights with jets really would be the future of modern aviation combat. I think we're just going to ignore the fact that he said World War I dogfight. 
Wait, no. Boyd is a military veteran, but he is not a yeah, combat okay, never mind. veteran. He never saw combat, never completed a full tour of duty, and was whisked away to be an instructor at Nellis Air Force Base, or possibly a student who rose to the top of his class so quickly and was so brilliant, they said, hey, you should be teaching the class, and asked him to remain behind as a professor. Some sources disagree. Point is, as anyone in the Air Force will tell you, that doesn't just happen to anyone. If you want a prestigious position like that, you have to know people. And Boyd, well, he knew people. People that got him into that comfortable desk position long before he could actually ever see combat. Like our friend Chungus, he would Nepotism. remain in perfect safety, writing theories upon theories, uh, knowing that he would never have to actually put them into practice himself. Like Chungus, the only time he fought was in training battles against trainee pilots, who had all learned from him what to do, meaning their actions were always easily predictable, meaning Boyd would always win, even with a disadvantaged starting position. And like Chungus, this earned him a favoured reputation among amongst the Air Force pilots who he trained. But unlike Chungus, the pilots Boyd trained would eventually see action in Vietnam, where the Air Force's performance was somewhat lacklustre. And I find it a somewhat large coincidence that in Vietnam, the supposed best fighter pilot in the US is regulated to a desk job as the vice commander of an electronic intelligence gathering force. His service goes undecorated, and he returns to the US after just a year. What's most interesting is when the 56 Boyd's group is later returned to the US to learn to fly fighter aircraft. Boyd, who you'd expect to be in the perfect position to train them, being a fighter pilot trainer, is not among them. You see, a huge mythos around Vietnam exists. A massive part of that comes from the fight to play mafia who have created an endless narrative that has found its way into books and films and documentaries and even into the public mindset that it was the lack of guns on American fighter planes and the dependency on missiles that led to the Air Force's lacklustre performance. This is not true. The American planes all had guns already installed, mostly on pods along the wings, and even if the integration of a dedicated nose cannon onto the F-4 did prove a significant change, it does not explain how the Navy's F-4, which never received that nose cannon upgrade, also began performing better at around the same time. Because in reality, it had nothing to do with guns or missiles. It was all down to training. Lack of pilot training, ground crew training, even the maintenance of the missile systems themselves and the strict, unflexible doctrine that they had to be used under had been the major factors of the US Air Force's lacklustre performance. Now, I'm not blaming Boyd specifically, but I do suspect from his reputation and general attitude that he was part of that big ego culture of we know better training instructors, in which the Air Force had to almost completely wipe out and start again from scratch. I'm sorry, what's going on here? The Navy had to completely replace with their own now famous Top Gun program. I'm not saying Boyd alone was responsible for this culture, but he was part of it. And potentially, if he had trained his pilots to beat him in combat rather than using them to show off how good he was. Wait a second, wait a second, I just thought that thing with the like the talking can and stuff, was that an MS3 uh, was that an MS MS3K3000 uh, reference? Maybe they would have performed just a little bit better. This is potentially the reason why Boyd is not invited to form part of that new training structure, why his theories have remained largely theories, and why he has a seemingly token position in Vietnam, and why, like Burton, he has retired in his prime. But of course, that would discredit the basis of the fight to play Mafia, the idea that Boyd was part of a culture whose theories on how fighter aircraft could and should be used, a culture that trained pilots to stick to a strict doctrine and fill in the blanks with trust your instincts. Use the force, Luke. <laughs> which all completely fell apart after its flaws were exposed in actual combat, would mean that their founding father, their leading champion, could almost be described as a fraud. So much simpler narrative is created, one where the gun always beats the missile, and Vietnam proves it. Because if you reduce a complicated problem to a single sentence, you can easily sell it to the public, who will yeah. chest thump and throw temper tantrums and embarrass themselves publicly before ever admitting that the thing they learned in school that they've known their entire life is wrong. I will fully admit, I at one time believed that I remember, and I remember I, you know, learned it from one of those specials that they showed on, like, either Discovery Channel or History Channel before, uh, before History Channel went completely down the drain that it is now. And I can't really say when I stopped believing. It was just sort of something that faded away with time. With me. Though, admittedly, I never did the whole chest-bumping thing and 
tapping online because I've never really been into that sort of thing. I'm painting a picture here, but I don't think Boyd was some sort of evil specter. He was a good man, and I, I fully believe he had the best of intentions and honestly believed he thought he was doing some measure of good. But he was a very headstrong individual. He had a short fuse. He had no tolerance for people who disagreed with him. He had a massive ego and could never see the flaws or feelings in his belief. And most importantly, he was wrong. And had his legacy ended in 1975 when he retired, there would be no reason for me to make this video. No reason for me to single him out amongst a legion of people who have been wrong that has decorated every air force around the world since aircraft have been a thing. But Boyd yeah. was brought in as an advisor to the Pentagon's F-15 fighter program. He and this book claim he was highly influential in his design, that he personally led the team which redesigned the entire fighter plane to make it cheaper, faster, more cost efficient, better in every way possible to the monstrosity that the Air Force had proposed. And it's not just this book, there are videos on YouTube of him bragging about this. I've heard these words from his own mouth. We came up with a 40,000 pound airplane with a 1.1 thrust away ratio instead of 0.75, wing loading is 65, and uh, I forget, and I can remember, but a lot cheaper. And they had one of a really, you know, a real Hummer, and that became the F. And to be fair, he is partially correct. The Air Force did design a billion dollar monster that would have never worked. But they knew that. They knew it wouldn't work, hence why they brought people like Boyd in. And Boyd would always maintain that his redesign would go on to become the F-14, while his later redesign into a lightweight single-engine fighter would become the F-16. And it is here that I lose my respect for Boyd. It is here that I question what I said earlier about him being a good person, because it is here I know he is lying. Boyd's contribution to the design of the F-15 was not a blueprint. It was not a new fighter plane, it was not a team which went on to design the F-16. It was a computer model that showed how control services could affect flight characteristics. Oh, really? That was it. Boyd's proposal for a single-engine subsonic fighter with no missile hardpoints and fuel that relied entirely on external drop tanks is what caused oh. the Navy to quit the program and design their own jet, which would become the F-14. My God, I can't. Mm. The number of times I've heard that, like no missiles, no, it, 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 uh, external fuel tanks. Uh, it's all pain. It's all pain. To which Boyd or the rest of the fighter plane mafia would have absolutely nothing to do with. Boyd's proposal would be scrapped shortly after due to the introduction of the MiG-25, and Boyd would throw a temper tantrum so large we still feel the effects of it today. He would go on to become one of the founders of the famous fighter play mafia, who would shape a narrative of incompetence at the highest levels of the Pentagon that people still believe to this day, and that can still be seen in critiques of the F-35, and the work done by the Pogel Foundation which was created to carry on Boyd and the fighter play mafia's legacy. The reason I say all of this is, well, firstly, these people have a tendency to get very vocal when faced with any sort of criticism and are quick to go running to their lawyers. And let's face it, YouTube's copyright takedown system is about as vulnerable to exploitation as a 4chan neckbearder is to a crypto scam. But also, Ugh. when it comes to the fighter play mafia, many are just not fully aware of how deep this rabbit hole goes. And most people know of Spray because of how comedically wrong he was on the F-35 and how most critique of the jet eventually leads back to him and the work he did for Russia today. But Boyd is a much larger piece of the puzzle. Not only is the Air Force still obsessed with him and the Oda Loop, or the Uda Loop as Spiney calls it, I've even seen it being used by many motivational speakers as if understanding the loop is the key to unlocking the fabled maximum productivity of legend. Ooh. And I'm sorry <laughs> to say, US Air Force, I like you, but there is a reason that the Oda Loop sees very little to no reference outside of the Air Force, in spite of its proclaimed wide-reaching applications, and that is because the Oda Loop is, the Oda is Loop? complete gibberish. It's the most complicated and convoluted way of saying monkey see, monkey do ever created, and its technical definition changes drastically depending on who you ask. But at its core, it's not actually wrong. Humans do think like this, and Boyd's intention of using the Loop to understand how to get into the heads of enemy fighter pilots does have merit as an idea. 
but the loop itself, in spite of being completely obsessed over, has little to no practical application by itself, and nothing so far has ever proven otherwise. It is describing the tip of the iceberg of an extremely complicated issue in the most complicated way possible, in a way to appeal to people unqualified to understand it, written by a man who was unqualified to talk about it. Boyd did not so much invent the loop as define something that was already obvious. In other words, it's a complicated subject, oversimplified and then re-complicated to appeal to a mindset of people who like words inside of coloured boxes and arrows, <laughs> and only by understanding the arrows can we truly understand ourselves. Like Boyd's actions in his trainer pilot days, it is designed to make him look smart, not actually have any real-world application. And this is my general impression of Boyd in a nutshell. Boyd's Wikipedia article reads like a love letter to the Omnissiah, and I once saw Pierre Spray and Thomas Christie Omnissiah. give an interview where they spoke about Boyd as a maverick, but to hear him talk, they said, and then they both comedically gasped at the same time, as if listening to a Boyd lecture was like hearing the words from the very mouth of the God Emperor of Mankind. And the thing is, I have heard him talk. I'll leave a link in the description to some of his lectures so that you can verify for yourself that Boyd, when he talks in these lectures, is almost completely incomprehensible. He talks about the most basic of fundamentals of some very deep subjects in the most complicated way he possibly can. And the the principles he preaches are so far removed from reality that any practical application becomes almost impossible. And this, in my opinion, is Boyd's intention. He knows what he is saying sounds plausible and he knows you'll feel smart for listening and potentially even a little giddy when he wanders off on a tangent about how this one time he shouted at some dumb Air Force colonel. And he knows if he gets that sauce of anecdotes and clever sounding words just right, you'll be strung along without question, thinking that you're learning something important even if you have absolutely no way of putting that knowledge into practice. In reality, nothing Boyd has ever said has been proved through any practical application. The Oda loop is gibberish, and Boyd's one true claim to fame, energy maneuverability theory, was copied largely from the work of one Edward Rowitzki's energy approach to the general aircraft performance problem, which was published a decade earlier. In short, mm. most of what Boyd is known for is a repackage of other people's work presented in a simplified way that appeals to people with limited to no understanding of the subject, and in my own opinion does little to simply prove prove how smart Boyd thinks he is, and this is evident in the way in which he presents lectures, talking in extremes of length, refusing to simplify or explain and berating anyone at length who fails to understand him. The work of turning Boyd into an almost religious icon of the reformist movement came at the hands of one William S. Lind, an alleged white supremacist who is credited as the major spokesman behind cultural Marxism, a conspiracy theory that proclaims German Jews are secretly working to undermine the ethics of American churches and schools. He wants- Wait, seriously? The only thing I'm going to say is, why is it always the Jews? I mean, if you're going to hate an arbitrary group of people for- literally no reason to me. Can you at least try to be, like, original? Like, why not pull an Austin Powers and hate the Dutch? Nobody hates the Dutch. It, it, it's completely untilled soil. I mean, if you're gonna look stupid anyway, at least try to, you know, look, no, that look credible while doing it? No, that doesn't really work at all. I have no idea where I was going with this, I'm sorry wrote a book called Victoria, a novel of fourth generation war, in which a self-insert character along with a group of Christian marines leads an armed resistance against the said Marxist Jews as the federal government collapses around them. I wonder what he was doing on January the 6th. But back on subject, Boyd is somewhat of a difficult person to evaluate. His works are so far removed from any practicality, and objective analysis of them that is entertaining enough for a YouTube video is almost impossible, and Boyd's own attitude makes understanding them even harder. His works on the F-16 is largely credited via word of mouth and anecdotes from his friends, and is ultimately overshadowed by his temper tantrum on the F-15, and his demands that the US switch to human wave tactics of F-5E Tigers. The reformers are a rabbit hole that go much deeper than her der sprayed at a funny, which is the rhetoric you typically see in the growing anti-reformist crowd, and in the new year I do plan to dive down that rabbit hole, which for me is going to be a very fun journey. Note the sarcasm oh. in my voice. So if you wish oh, to no. come along, there is a button for that. But before I leave, I wish to apologise. Many of you have noted a somewhat lack of content recently, and that's because I'm moving house, and city, and country, which is a very... Lack of content. What was I saying at the beginning of this video? Long and stressful process. So thank you for bearing with me. Normal scheduling outside of someone trying to sue me will resume in the new year. Have a fantastic holiday, depending on which one you celebrate. And if you don't celebrate any, have a fantastic bottle of wine.
Uh, something, something, something. Funny drunk pig. Like. I mean, just. The magic of propaganda, eh? Whether it's by government or just by people with large amounts of money and nepotism at their hands. Uh, oh, I mean, I, I for one, am going to be looking forward to those videos. Uh, very much so. Uh, yeah, nothing else really to say here, but yeah. I uh, hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if not. Uh, original, it will, as always, linked in the description. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.